Good morning. This is the Jeff Santos Show. I'm Jeff Santos, and we have a great program for you today. We're going to be taking a look at what is right now, after the midterms, uh, what is at stake for this country in terms of three issues. First one is protecting the country and the problems that our president has with our allies in Europe and, and other places. Uh, and what kind of conflicts does his own personal business relationships, Saudi Arabia as an example, have on the rest of our country. We'll talk to Larry Korb, former Vietnam veteran, former uh, defense official on the Reagan administration and now with the Center for American Progress. Second issue is labor. And we're going to talk with uh, the president of uh, the United States Steelworkers Local 12012, John Bonapane, will be here in studio with us to discuss not only a lockout that's been going on for 22 weeks now, started in the summertime, but pitting young workers versus old workers, and what does it mean for labor right now? And lastly, we'll talk about something that I'm very concerned about as a media member, community media. You know, we broadcast right here in Somerville every week. We have a great staff led by Erica Jones and Adam Stone. And the fact is, is that that community media could go away because there are problems right now with the FCC and the oversight of it and the real lack of understanding of the need for community media. All this coming up on The Jeff Santos Show. We'll be right back, and we'll start it up. If you smoked, this new lung cancer screening could save your life. Visit SaveByTheScan.org. Welcome back. It is The Jeff Santos Show that you're tuned into here on Free Speech TV. We're here every Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 7 o'clock Pacific, and again replayed at 1 o'clock Eastern and 10 o'clock Pacific Time. Our next guest is a regular on The Jeff Santos Radio Show. He is the uh, former Assistant Secretary of Defense under the Reagan administration, now a senior fellow at the Center for uh, American Progress. And, of course, uh, it's great to have him on Free Speech TV. His first time, Larry Korb joins us from Washington, D.C. Larry, great to have you on the program. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's great to see you for the first time. It is indeed. We do this radio thing all the time. You know, it's like we're invisible, right? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, somebody who's not invisible is the current president of the United States. And this uh, conversation um, will take um, a lot of uh, about him. We'll try not to mention him as much. People are sick and tired of hearing that name. But um, I want to start off with the fact, as we said at the top of the of the show today, you know, the pillars of democracy are a free press. And we talked We'll be talking with uh, folks from uh, the Alliance for Community Media. Um, and then we're going to talk with uh, a good friend of ours, uh, John Bonapane from uh, Steelworkers. The United Steelworkers have been locked out, you know, over, over disputes uh, by a utility, National Grid. And the other part, of course, is the basic, you know, protection, protecting of the homeland and protecting, you know, the people in it, in this case, from their, their president, which is sad to think about. But in, in this way, we are really, you know, in a very difficult position. And I'm wondering, having worked for a conservative president in Ronald Reagan and having seen others, the Bushes and so forth, is this the biggest challenge in, in your lifetime, um, you know, to, to a democracy, having a president who has his hands on the nuclear button and obviously can order people with, you know, with Congress, um, you know, to go to war. Well, there's no doubt about the fact that the president has overwhelming powers. I mean, he has control over nuclear weapons. And the problem is not just Trump's erratic behavior, but he doesn't listen to other people. When you, he's been discussing all of these issues, he thinks he knows more. You know, the military scheduled a two-hour brief for him at, uh, and, and when he went over to the Pentagon. He, he, he was out of there in about 20 minutes. And, and, you know, those are the type of things, no matter who you are, whatever woman or man becomes to the White House, even if you've been doing a lot of things, you really don't know everything. And you need to make sure that you're brought up to speed because you have this power. And then, of course, if you 
try and stop the press from checking on you, it becomes uh, even more worrisome. You know, people talk about, you know, now hey, with Vietnam, we would almost still be there if the press wasn't reporting. And you had people like Cy Hirsch talking about me lie. And in the same way, when you have Afghanistan, how well is that going? Well, the military, of course, they say it's going well. But if you listen to the reporters on the ground, it's not. It was the me media that told us that, you know, uh, Iraq did not have nuclear weapons. So those are the type of things that, uh, that, that, that you need. And so you really have a problem. You have somebody comes in without the background, doesn't listen to people, and then tries to stop those who disagree with them. We're talking with uh, Larry Korb here on the Jeff Santos Show. He's also a Vietnam vet and, uh, again, um, now with the Center for American Progress. I, I'm concerned, Larry, that, um, you know, a lot of people, and we, we've talked about this before, too, you know, they don't vote. They don't know the inner workings. Uh, obviously, they don't want to see their kids um, or their parents, you know, die in foreign wars. I think American people are sick of that. That's left, right, and center. Um, but there are some problems here, and I want to go through them one by one, if I can, with you. Let, starting with the fact that, um, you know, Mr. Mattis, uh, James Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, um, is frustrated with the fact that, you know, he has to go to the border, he has to do these things that are really, you know, uh, a disgrace in a lot of ways to bring the American military thing down for a political stunt. There is no invasion uh, of the border. Uh, these are people who are coming across, um, you know, with, with, you know, with suitcases. They're not coming across with guns. And just to send him down there and to send all the troops down there, to me, is, is not only a crazy thing, but it's, it's, it's taking our eye off the ball with all the other issues around the world. Um, so let's start there. By doing this, is this forcing Mattis to sort of say, look, I, I can't deal with this anymore? And then it opens the door to Trump to do what he just did with the AG to bring in somebody who's basically going to be a yes man to him. Well, the fact of the matter is that many people are disappointed that Mattis went along with this. You know, he said, we don't do stunts, but he did not object. And the problem you have with Mattis is that he's a military person. We had to get him a waiver to be Secretary of Defense. I think any of the civilians I work with, you know, Frank Carlucci, Bob Gates, <clears throat> you know, Bill Perry or Bill Cohen, would have said, Mr. President, this is wrong. Now, you have the authority to do that, but if you do it, I've got to leave. And I think that would have gotten people's attention. In addition to the fact that it's not necessary, you're taking kids who have spent a lot of time away from home on the holidays in Iraq and Afghanistan or in, right. in, 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 in Niger, and you're going to take them away from home for no good reason. And, and you're going to take them away from the training they need to do to carry out their military missions. It's outrageous. Uh, I, I, just, I just fear. And, and the other part of this is that whether, whether or not, uh, whether it's Mattis or somebody else, you know, there's this whole idea of going after Iran. You know, you couple this with what has happened recently in Saudi Arabia with the, uh, the death of the journalist Khashoggi. Um, you know, where, where are we in terms of time and how worried are you that if Mattis does leave, that we are on a war path toward war or some kind of conflict with Iran? Well, the fact of the, ma the matter is that you really do need the checks on the, on the president. I think if Mattis were to leave and Trump wanted to appoint someone else, the con confirmation hearing would be pretty rigorous. And basically, I think what would happen is the Jack Shanahan, the deputy, would move up. And he's, you know, he's a pretty, pretty balanced, uh, you know, individual. He's not one of the, you know, the Trump, uh, Trump, uh, you know, uh, lo lo loyalist. But no, I hope Mattis does stay. And I don't think Trump will force him out. 
because he's got too much political stature. People like him, people respect him. And even Trump, you know, the mad dog and all of that, I think Trump would like him to resign. He said a couple of times, well, he's probably ready to go. And, uh, you know, he's really a Democrat, he said at one time. So, but I don't think Mattis is going to go. And I think that members, uh, you know, foreign uh, national security specialists are going to urge him not to do that. Because we don't know, like when Sessions went, then they put this guy Whitaker in there. God, right. help exactly. us have a social like that in the Pentagon. Uh, we're talking with Larry Korb here on the Jeff Santos Show. Um, how much on this issue will the Democrats control in the House? They don't control the Senate, which there's a lot of obviously confirmations and so forth that go through there. Um, but how much will change in Washington and how much will be recognized uh, by our, uh, our allies, um, which seemingly are falling by the wayside, um, you know, particularly in Europe, uh, because of Trump's, uh, um, abusive uh, rhetoric toward them. Um, what changes uh, in, in January? Well, I think in, in foreign policy, the House can stop the arms sales to Saudi Arabia until they really take action to deal with Khashoggi, because all of the arms sales have to be approved by the, uh, you know, by the Congress if they're over, you know, a certain certain amount, which the, these are. I think the the other thing that they they can uh, they can do is they can put pressure on Trump to enforce the sanctions we put in against uh, Russia, which he has been very, very slow in uh, doing that because they'll have the power of the purse. Remember, the, all the, uh, the spending bills got to start in the House, which they now control. So if you want to you know, get these uh, spending things. And I think another thing that's going to happen is Trump has embarked on, in my view, a very dangerous nuclear strategy. You know, he wants to build new tactical nuclear weapons. I think the Democrats are going to really stop that from happening. Adam Smith, who's a chairman of House Armed Services Committee, has already come out and spoken against that. So I think they will have, uh, you know, some uh, impact there. And they'll, I think, uh, also be able to, to stop us helping the Saudis in Yemen and, you know, cut off the aid that we're giving them, providing drone information and refueling and stuff like that. So I think they will have some uh, some impact in those areas. Uh, and, and finally, Larry, do you, do you feel that we're at a point right now where our relationships, particularly with Europe um, and particularly with NATO, because, of course, Turkey is now in play here. They have the information that he won't visit. And there's this, this whole thing about the uh, individual in Pennsylvania that uh, is a rival of the, of, the, of the president of Turkey, Erdogan. Um, how much does this whole thing now come out? Because there's such a rift between ourselves and our allies. And, you know, Trump just wants them to pay up, you know, in terms of their membership. It, it, it just seems like the the priorities are all mixed up, to say the least. Well, he has made a bad situation worse. There's no doubt that these countries should be paying more for defense. There's not a NATO you know, fund that you put in, like a membership fee or anything like that. They should be improving uh, their, their defense. But the way to get them to do that is not to start an argument with you know, prime minister, the the British prime minister and the French president over you know these public uh, spats. Right. That does not uh, does not help. I mean, he castigated Theresa May on on the phone on his way over there, criticized Macron, the president of. That's not the way to do it. You got to work with them. They're moving in the right direction. Should they move more quickly? Sure, but beating them up publicly is not going to help it because now politically, if they do it, they're going to look like they came into him. Well, exactly. And, and, and I want to get, you know, 30 seconds on this situation with, with Erdogan. You know, this, this individual being sent over there potentially to do his death, for all we know. Um, you know, how, do, how does this thing get resolved? Well, again, basically, you know, uh, the, prime, the, uh, the pastor Gullian was, there's no evidence there. And if you send them back without our, I think our courts would stop that because, they have not presented any evidence that shows he was involved in the attempted coup, which mm. is what Erdogan is, is uh, Clean. claiming. Fascinating. Larry Korb, Center for American Progress, thank you for everything. 
We uh, very much appreciate it. We look forward to having you back on TV okay. as well as radio. <laughs> okay. Take care. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you too. Larry Korb right here on the Jeff Santos Show. We're right back after this timeout. This is the story of a boy who didn't talk for a long time. The boy liked things to always be the same. Any changes would scare and upset him. The unknown was an unfriendly place. The boy was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. He wasn't trying to be mean, it just made him feel uncomfortable. Sometimes he would flap his arms again and again. One day, I found out I had something called autism. My family got me help. Slowly, I found my voice and learned all the way I could live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at autismspeaks.org. What to expect when you're expecting a teenager. Hey guys, today we're talking about how to wake up your teen. And this works literally every time. Give kisses. Give kisses. Look. Give kisses. Give kisses. You heard how loud that was. I you know. Sleep I heard, through that. I heard. It, 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 it wasn't you. Yeah. It was the. Is that bacon? You don't have to know it all to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. Bacon. Bacon. In five, four, three, <clears throat> two, one. Welcome back. You're tuned in to the Jeff Santos Show. Again, we're here every Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time and 7 o'clock Pacific Time. Really early, but you can catch us on the replay, 1 o'clock Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. As we said, we're going to discuss the issue of labor today, and this issue is both a personal one for me and also a tragic one for the state and the country. Uh, back in July, uh, National Grid locked out its employees, um, and it has been since then, and we're now, of course, in late November, uh, these folks are still locked out. It is becoming a crisis for families with health care, um, with you know, savings and a number of other issues. Here to discuss it today with me here in studio is the president of uh, Local 102, Local 1212, uh, the president of that uh, union, John Bonaparte. John, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. To, great to have you here. I know Thanks it's the greatest me. of uh, times for you. No, no. But, uh, you know, it's just, it's just outrageous. Um, so we had on your vice president on our Labor Day special, which Free Speech TV, um, you know, uh, took and, and broadcast and around the country. And, you know, we thought that that could, you know, help uh, push, you know, to a solution. But it seems to me as of this date, there's no solution. No, there hasn't been. Um, National Grid is really dug their feet in. Um, they are trying to exact concessions from a group of employees who are basically what we think public safety workers, um, we help provide a safe national uh, natural gas product um, through the gas system. Um, we service cities and towns all the way from Boston up to the New Hampshire border. Our people are, are very experienced and knowledgeable. Um, we take a lot of pride in what we do, and it's really been shameful how we've been treated. Um, we've, been locked, we've been locked out now. We're in the 22nd week. Um, we had our health care taken away um, on July 1st. We were actually locked out on June 25th, had the health care cut for tw over 1,200 people and their families on July 1st. I had our paychecks cut. We had people who were out sick and injured at the time who had their sick benefits cut. Um, a lot of people have been struggling for a long time um, because of what we think is, is greed, pure right. and simple. Um, 
from a multinational company. They're based in the United Kingdom. Um, they're a big corporation. Um, they own a lot of smaller regional gas and electric type companies that they've bought throughout the years. Um, and we really can't understand what, why we're being treated the, this way. Talking with John Bonapani and the president of uh, Local 12012 covers uh, the area from the New Hampshire border south, uh, towns like Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, Amesbury, uh, Malden, Massachusetts as well. And uh, it is a real tragedy what is happening, folks. Uh, again, we have a, a, a corporate uh, titan internationally owned uh, in the UK trying to take on uh, workers who are struggling to get by and it's, it's causing, you know, tremendous complications. I want to get into that. But, you know, at the same time, you mentioned public safety. And we saw what happened when, um, you know, the Columbia gas situation happened. It was a horror story here in, in greater Boston, made national news again. Um, and, you know, what, what, what the current governor, and just got reelected, um, did was give a, another company, as opposed to having you know, eventually changed, but... Originally, they went to a privatized way of dealing with this Eversource, another company that's based here in Massachusetts, to be the, the referee in a sense. I mean, this is just, it's, it's becoming almost like a third world country in a sense of having one corporation overseeing another. Well, I, I, I questioned when, when, when that happened, the, the first question I asked myself was, why, why isn't the, the Department of Public Utilities right. taking control of this operation. Uh, I'm not sure why. They, I, I know that they're, in my opinion, completely understaffed. Right. Um, they don't have enough people to, to um, o oversee all the different gas companies in the state. But um, when, when something like that happens, and it, uh, it shouldn't happen, right. uh, a, a company that's responsible for providing gas service should be able to manage any type of situation, whether it's a um, emergency situation or just the day-to-day -day operation. Um, if they can't do that, um, I don't know why they should be allowed to continue. And if they can't do that, I don't think the answer is to bring in another company to do it for them. I think the the, the people who are should be responsible for overseeing them should be taking control uh, of the operation. Um, and that wasn't done, obviously, and I, I could speculate as to, you know, why they couldn't or didn't. But that's my opinion what, what should have been done. Um, as you know, National Grid right now, with, with, with us locked out, um, they're not operating the way they should right. be. And we've seen incidents, I think, in Lowell around a, a big folk festival that had there, and it's probably the biggest one the city has. Um, where there was a, a, a real uh, crisis that could happen. And a lot of your folks, including Jim Mariolis, who we had on as vice president, um, had to help out with, with all this insanity. So, yeah, there, there was a, uh, a, from what I was told, there was a gas leak outside the, the folk festival in Lowell, and it, it took them a, a, lot long, a long time to remediate the problem, um, something that we think our people would have taken care of with a lot less um, resources in a lot shorter time. Um, we've been filing complaints at the Department of Public Utilities since um, late June, early July about what we think is unsafe activity by replacement workers. Um, for the most part, ma many of them um, don't have nearly the same field experience that our people do. Um, and it's it's just the way it is when yeah. you're not when you don't have the experience actually working hands on on the on, on the equipment on on the piping, um, it just it stands to reason you just you're not going to have the same level of expertise as, as the people who do that every day and have done it for years. So we filed a number of complaints and the DPU um, finally um, issued what's called an exit letter. Um, which is basically the first step in an investigatory process, which could lead to a uh, what they call a notice of probable violation. It's a it could be a violation of federal pipeline safety regulations, and our local alone right now is is up to eighty five um, of these complaints that we that we think will, will eventually lead to an or could lead to an NOPV. 
Right. And we're talking with here John Bonapane of the United States Steelworkers, uh, president of uh, Local 12012 here in Massachusetts as we talk here on the Jeff Santo Show. You know, one of the things that's happened in talking to some of your, your colleagues about this is this, to me, and you hear it, you saw it with uh, the recent uh, uh, National Transportation Safety Board made an accusation of an inexperienced worker being the problem with the Columbia situation, Columbia gas with the with the leaks and the uh, fires there. Um, it, it seems to me that a lot of international and national corporations here in the U.S. are pitting young workers versus old. They, they, uh, they pay the, the pensions that you guys have worked for for many years, that people have organized for many years, but they don't want to do the same for the younger people. Hire them cheap, uh, don't pay them the benefits, and eventually, you know, these folks don't stay because they don't have the, the same benefits that, that they anticipated. And then, of course, you get, you know, problems with the quality of work. Talk to me about that. So it's kind of two different angles I can talk about it. One is from a utility industry um, perspective. You really need people to be career invested in these jobs. That These jobs have what we call institutional knowledge. It's knowledge that you um, gain from working on the pipeline over a long period of time. Sure. And at some point you become an expert and you become very proficient and you pass that knowledge on to the next generation of workers as they do the same thing. Um, if you create a situation where you have turnover, constant turnover, because they're not career invested, because they don't have a pension and they don't have good ben benefits, excuse right. me. <clears throat> and they can go to any other company and get the same pay or a reasonable pay, um, and they don't have to deal with the responsibility of working on a gas pipeline. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. a huge public safety issue. Or they don't have to work in the, um, the extreme conditions we work in. You're going to have a problem, obviously, um, and I think it should be in everybody's interest um, to make sure that people have a long-term career and want to stay at these ut utilities for 30, 40 years, and uh, I've been working 30 years in the field myself. <clears throat> From the perspective of corporations and, and how they're pitting workers against each other, it, it all comes down to the bottom line. Um, they want the older um, employees who, who've, who've been here a while, who've gained those benefits from other employees who preceded them um, through bargaining and sacrifice. Right. They want us to to give that up for people who haven't come in yet. Um, and we're, we're, we're fighting very hard to prevent that. Um, and that's the, their game is obviously, eventually have a workforce that doesn't have nearly the same right. uh, benefit level or in the end. If we, they can bust the union and, and just, you know. Then they'll just be able to do whatever they want. Yeah. Um, uh, we have say in what happens at this company, not only when it comes to benefits and pay, but safety. Um, because we're in a union, we have certain protections and our people can speak out about certain things that are happening. Um, and it may not be anything malicious, it may be just something's yeah. happening that shouldn't be happening and people are afraid to, um, when they don't have the protection, people are afraid to, to point those things out. Um, the basic prevention of stuff, yeah. So we, we, th we think it's really important to try and preserve what we have for, for the next generation of workers. And obviously you've got a corporation that their primary objective is to make money. Um, that's it. Um, and they have their long-term plans, they have their short-term plans. And you know, we're, we're doing everything we can to, to protect um, the new employees from, from some of those plans. I, I, I want to just ask, because this is something that came up um, you know, back in July when we first started talking about this, there was one individual, I believe, in South Boston who had uh, a son who was, um, um, had, had some illness. And where, what is the status of that? In I can't speak to the particulars of that, but there, there are a number of people who had serious medical issues when they locked us out. Sure. Um, we had one uh, member, long-term employee, ha has about 40 years. He's a double amputee, Ugh. and he was in a rehabilitation center to help him, um, you know, use the prosthetics. And um, he was told he had to leave when they cut the um, insurance. Um, eventually, we were able to, you know, help him stay. It took a lot of work, but it, 
it was just, uh, again, it was something that didn't have to happen. They, him and his family went through a lot of grief um, because of what National Grid did. All because of greed, folks. Yes. Well, we get uh, just a couple of minutes remaining here. When we look at the results of the midterm, the Democrats take back the House, of course, uh, when a number of governorships, particularly in the Midwest, where, where Donald Trump, of course, did well in 16. What do you think this means for labor, for your fight in particular, and for, you know, labor in this country? And as we said at the top, the unions are a key part. Labor, the right to organize, um, are, are, are a massive, massive part of any democracy. Absolutely. Um, what do you see going forward? Well, I, I hope to see um, the labor movement re-energized by, by this change. Um, historically, Democrats have, have always tried to work hand in hand uh, with labor and vice versa. Um, labor obviously needs the Democrats to step up and start doing things that will be um, really effective. I think the number one um, issue that they should be looking at is orga organizing. Um, unions have a very hard time organizing in today's environment, and I think it's something that they really should be focusing on um, because a, a, anyone who pays attention to what's going on in the labor movement um, knows that uh, the numbers um, you know, not, aren't what they used to be the number of organized right. union labor compared to um, non-organized union labor. Um, and so that has to change um, because, as you said, uh, unions are vital in, in, in keeping democracy alive. Um, they really are. Uh, you, need, you need an organized voice that speaks for working people. There's no other organization out there. And if there is one, please tell me other than a union that does that. There isn't. No, there, there really is, isn't. It does not exist. No. Um, and it, if you look around the world, that's how these European democracies, uh, Australia and others, have been able to sort of, you know, have a working um, class, middle class that's been strong for years without it. And the way I, and, I, and I'm not an expert on what happens in other countries, but from the limited, limited knowledge that I have, I'd say that the labor movements um, are much more tied into the political movements, and right. especially in Europe. Right. Um, and, uh, and it should be that There's way here. Labor Party is an example. Right, right, exactly. Okay. Um, it should be that way here. Why it isn't, I'm, part, I'm sure there's a bunch of different reasons for why it isn't, but the Democratic Party has historically been that Labor Party for us. They have to get back to that. Yeah, certainly. They really have to stop paying a lot of attention to what's going on um, with the labor movement and what's going on um, and working people's lives in general. And I, I think they know that after seeing what happened two years ago in the presidential election. Um, I think a lot of people understood, or at least I did, why many of those people may have voted um, for the person they did. I, I think a lot of people feel like they've been ignored. And, and I to completely get that. I, I hear it from some of our members. Um, it's no up doubt. it's up to the Demo of, yeah. it's up to the Democrats to change that no one's going to change it for them there's no doubt and whether it's it's people like Bernie Sanders or Sherrod Brown Absolutely. or Elizabeth Warren people yeah. like that that have been big fighters for labor they have to come through and, and hopefully one of them gets elected uh, John for anybody who wants to uh, help out uh, donate volunteer just get involved how do they do so website uh, phone number well, we, we do have a um, Facebook page, USW12012. Um, we post a lot of information on that. We have a Twitter account. I'd have to get back to you with the, okay. the, the hashtag. But um, just if I can ask people to do anything, it, it would probably be to contact their state legislators and, and you know a ask them to, to really get involved and make a difference in, in this dispute. Um, By the way, here in Massachusetts, it's 617-722-2000 is this main switchboard number for the Massachusetts State Legislature. Thank you. There's several um, bills right now pending at the State House. One would extend our unemployment insurance, um, and one would um, provide health care um, for the employees who are locked out, and also um, prevent National Grid from making uh, millions of dollars well. Um, they have their employees locked out. So if, if you could take the time to call your state legislator and, and express your views about you know, how you feel we're being treated, 
um, by a multinational billion dollar company, that, that would probably be the most effective way they could help out right now. John, thank you. All thank the you, best. Jeff. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Same to you. Appreciate Thanks. it. We'll be right back. This is the Jeff Santos Show. Keep on fighting, folks. Be right back. If you smoked, this new lung cancer screening could save your life. Visit SaveByTheScan.org. We are back, and it's our Won't Back Down segment. Of course, uh, we love the fact that uh, people give us a call back and email us. Uh, you can do so, Jeff, at RevolutionBoston.com. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter at Jeff Santos Show. My Won't Back Down minute is all about media. Without a free press, we are living in a dictatorship, folks. And what has happened, and I, I think recently with Donald Trump and Jim Acosta of CNN, is outrageous. This has never happened before. We have seen, you know, organizations, you know, not given a press pass or two, uh, you know, a thought process by some of our presidents. Richard Nixon had an enemies list as an example. But to actually take a press pass away, thank God the court's still able to intervene and gave it back to Mr. Acosta. But that's just an example of how even corporate media, which has given Trump, and if you remember during the campaign, free media up the kazoo. And the fact is, is that he has taken advantage of them of calling them the enemy of the people of the United States. Well, I can tell you this, I will not back down. As a local independent and national media member uh, that is funded through great sponsorships by labor and progressive organizations, we don't have the same corporate lobbyists that they do for national corporations that own the CNNs and the NBCs of the world. And, but we have to fight, and we will always fight to protect your voice, because without the American media, there is no hope to get out the information on the concerns of the environment, on the concerns about labor, on the concerns about our military. All of that goes right through the First Amendment, right through the free press. And yours truly, along with many others, will not back down on this issue. And we'll be right back after this. Time out. Why is Connor having trouble focusing in school? Having trouble finding Connor's middle school? Would you like directions? No, why is Connor having trouble focusing in school? Finding lowest airfare to Istanbul. No, I'm, I'm tired of fighting with him over homework. Home walk restaurant, need a review? No, I need help. He's very smart, but his mind it wanders. He's disorganized. I think I understand. Oh, good. French fries, finding best potatoes. No! Russet, fingerling, you can't go. <sighs> Why don't you understand me? Sorry, I was trying to show how Connor feels every day. Frustrating, isn't it? Redirecting to understood.org. For the one in five kids with learning and attention issues, this is what life can feel like. Explore understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues designed to help your child thrive in school and in life. Understood.org, because understanding is everything. Welcome back. You're watching Free Speech TV, The Jeff Santos Show. We're here every Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific time. Replay it again at 1 o'clock uh, Eastern, 10 o'clock Pacific time. It's great to have our next guest because, uh, as we said at the top, um, if you look at the need to organize with labor, the critical part of defending the country and not getting us into overextended wars. And the third part of that, of course, is a free press. And here to discuss the importance of community media, particularly when it comes to radio and television, is the president and CEO of the Alliance for Community Media, Mike, Mike Wassener. Mike, it's great to have you on the program. Welcome to the broadcast. Thanks, Jeff. Good to be here. It's great to have you here. So, as I said, you know, this is a, a very big part of, of our democracy, and we have seen the President of the United States go after reporters just recently, this whole thing with Mr. Acosta at CNN, uh, you know, constantly calling them the enemy of the people. At the same time, um, you know, community media, here what we do in Somerville, we broadcast our program from, you know, is always scraping by. The same thing goes for many other community media folks. Talk to us about what you do and, and where 
community media is in late 2018. So, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a Charles Dickens fan, Jeff. Uh, so it's like, uh, it's like the best of times and the worst of times. Yes, indeed. Um, it's the best of times in some ways because uh, local communities know the value of local voice. And they see uh, diminishing information resources. Local newspapers are going out of business. Uh, because yeah. of consolidation in the media industry. Right. You're seeing uh, mergers and acquisitions uh, in radio and television so that it's increasingly hard to hear something that's truly different. Like if you drive across the country listening to radio stations, yeah, Rush from Limbaugh market all the time. to market, you, you hear the same thing yeah. in just about every community. Um, and maybe there's a, a local drop in for weather, maybe, but that's about it. <clears throat> and and I think people are getting fed up with it. Now, flip it around, um, you've got, I think, an increasing concentration of control when it comes to media policy in America uh, that favors merger and acquisitions, uh, that actually doesn't favor local voice, um, and doesn't appreciate diversity of opinion as well as it should. Um, and, and this goes beyond the the, the current administration. This is actually sort of a long-standing yeah. you know, poli policy. Reagan, Clinton, can, both parties. And it's like a it's like a bipartisan thing, frankly, uh, where um, even though the FCC, for example, was founded in uh, the nineteen by the nineteen twenty nine Radio Act, um, that then became the the FCC in nineteen thirty four. Yeah, it was founded with the idea of localism as being sort of a, a foundational. Uh, uh, bedrock principle, uh, but I think it's fair to say it's 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 abandoned it in the last uh, 30 years um, by you know encouraging different types of mergers, uh, yeah. discouraging localism in, in television certainly um, uh, by doing a, a series of rulings that have hurt community television particularly, um, and in some states actually we see uh, community television basically doesn't really exist as as it does say, for example, in a state like Massachusetts, my, my home state of Minnesota. Um, so it's very much sort of like a state by state, region by region um, uh, success story. It's really, yeah. you know, in some in some places there's a lot of resources available. In some places there's almost nothing. Um, so that hurts the ability of local communities around the country to to truly express themselves well, uh, in our opinion. And and also it hurts local economies. Um, if you have local outlets that care about local economy and local businesses uh, of any stripe, you know, of any po any political background, um, uh, you actually have the ability to, to create, to basically sustain like a local ecosystem uh, when it comes to media, local business and information needs. Uh, I work with some communities across the country uh, where there's no local newspaper. Uh, the local radio stations basically uh, pump out material from, you know, Clear Channel or whoever. Uh, and, and there is no local TV because the, the, the community is outside the major DMA. Or maybe they're from a demographic group that doesn't matter. Uh, and I, I hate to say this, that, but very often, uh, you know, media is uh, beamed at people because of uh, the money they have, uh, their, their demographic course, profiles, yeah. and, the, and the products that they'll, uh, products that they'll buy, right? Um, that's not the reason why uh, we created uh, a free speech system in America. It wasn't so you could buy more stuff or have more things sold to you necessarily. I, it wasn't necessarily, uh, I think, put into the Constitution that buying more things was the, the thing that should be determining whether or not you know, our, our media system is working and healthy or not. Um, so I, I think you're seeing uh, uh, this sort of hunger that people have and this, frankly, this sort of technological and policy uh, situation where there's a lot of capacity, and a lot of possibility. We're, you know, we're talking via Skype today. Uh, I'm in D.C., you're in Somerville. We've got this potential to be able to create more content and distribute it, but the, the controlling mechanisms of policy and you know, sort of like uh, 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 and, and corporate organization basically make it very, very hard for, for producers uh, to be truly independent uh, in, in this society. So uh, it, again, it's like a best of times, worst, uh, worst of times type situation, I think, for community media. Um, you know, more specifically right now here in 2018, um, we're looking at an FCC that is, 
I would say hostile to local voices uh, because they get in the way of, of uh, large organizations, large corporations being able to make more, more profit. Um, and uh, at this point, you know, we're actually looking at a, a proposed rulemaking that the FCC's uh, issued that could diminish the ability of local communities to control their own property and their own rights of way um, and leverage that control to be able to actually communicate about what's going on in, in, a, in an individual community. Uh, and I can talk about that in more detail if you want. Uh, I, I have to be cognizant of the fact that Basically, I get up on a soapbox and go for as long as I <laughs> you let me go here, Jeff. So no, no, no. Uh, look, I think it, it's it's pretty simple that you know most of most people don't understand uh, unless you are in the media like you and I um, about all the all the restrictions and all the the barriers that have now been put up. And you mentioned you know that it's it's bipartisan, and um, you know that that to me is is a a major problem. Um, that you know, we don't have a, I think what is needed here um, is more of an investment and an understanding of the importance of it by our political leaders. And well, I mean, part of that is education, though. Who educates our political leaders to be doing work in technology and communication policy? By and large, <clears throat> it's, it's the beneficiaries of that policy, uh, corporations that have lobbyists to do that kind of education work. So I think it's incumbent upon uh, activists, labor unions, uh, environmentalists, uh, people who care about social justice, people who care about equality and equity in our society, to actually care about communications policy, uh, because it's not it shouldn't just be for wonks and technologists. Uh, you know, if if you depend upon um, uh, a phone, uh, a smartphone. Uh, a radio, uh, uh, a YouTube stream, uh, any type of communication about like how the world works, you you are a beneficiary of better communication policies. So I, I think we all need to step up and, and tell policymakers and uh, members of Congress particularly what's important in our lives. Um, for a, a number of us, uh, this uh, rulemaking that the FCC has put forward, uh, 18131, uh, this uh, rulemaking on, on cable franchising has been an opportunity for folks to be able to step up and say, listen, it's important that I have local resources uh, available on my uh, cable and, and Internet channels. It's important that my community has the ability to be able to sustain that resource with money uh, that comes from rent in the form of franchise fees. And it's important that the two things not be basically pitted against one another by this rulemaking. That's, I think, the core thing I want you to understand is that the, the rulemaking that we're talking about, the 18131, basically pits uh, communities against themselves. It says that uh, a cable company can define that the channels themselves that are a part of the rent for use of public rights of way can be charged back against the community's rent that you get in franchise fees. And so that means that a community like Somerville or, or here in DC has to choose between uh, the rent that it can rightfully charge for the use of public property or it can have a cable channel, but not both, which was not the intention of Congress. It's not what was set up in our system of localism. And it and was, was this, it was, if I could interrupt, yeah. was this something that Congress itself allowed to happen by deregulating it? No, I, 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 to be fair, Congress set up a system which was not the intention of Congress. It's not what was set up in our system of localism. And it and was, was this, it was, if I could interrupt, yeah. was this something that Congress itself allowed to happen by deregulating it? No, I, I, to be fair, Congress set up a system in 1984 uh, when it set up the, the Cable Act that allowed local communities to be able to charge rent <clears throat> for the use of public property. Right. It's kind of a system, it's a, it's, a, it's a principle I think most people understand. You have property, you have the ability to you know, rent it out for, for use. Uh, so for the public property that say a city manages or the public rights of way that be, allow a, a cable company to be able to get to your home or business with, with conduit, uh, the local community has the ability to charge rent and get capacity to be able to communicate with other people within that community. That, that's sort of the, the heart of the matter of the 1984 Cable Act. Um, what's happened, unfortunately, is that uh, the FCC interprets the law that Congress sets up. So really, it's the FCC that's to blame um, in terms of coming up with uh, administrative rulemaking procedures that diminish the power 
of one party or favor one party over another. They kind of, they're kind of the, the hand on the balance, if you will, right. uh, in, in a negotiation that happens between a corporation and a community, right? And, and, and this is sort of the sad fact, is that uh, if, you're a, if you're a small community and you can't afford a lengthy negotiation against a corporation that doesn't want to do business, you've got no rights. Yeah. Well, right? it, it is, you know, is it, you know this from, from how, how negotiations work. Um, sure. And so uh, what we're seeing now is the FCC basically tipping the scale more and more toward corporations and saying that local communities, but This local has been the case, though, are, Mike, for yeah. a while. The, the FCC oh, yeah. has got corporations, and then it's been more conservative than not, and it has been basically, you know, uh, National Association of Broadcasters, et cetera, been been basically you know pushing on a more commercial level f for a while now correct well that's right that's right i mean i, I think you know and, and i think the thing that i think shocked a lot of us uh, just this last year is the elimination of uh, what it's called the main studio rule now that that particularly relates to broadcasters it says that you know historically it says that if you're in a community if you have a license in a community you actually have to have a production studio there um the fcc eliminated that why did they eliminate that because they wanted to have uh, less production capacity across the United States and less localism so that broadcasters could make more profit. Yep. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of bald and blatant and right out there. It's not, you know. Um, now, to be fair, uh, the FCC said, well, we're going to have broadcasters save reporting by have them uh, not invest so much in studios. And I'm like, all right, I'm not quite sure how that logic works. You're going to have less production capacity, so there'd be more reporting. You know, that's the kind of tortured logic you see that, that happens when industry uh, tends to tip the balance in a rulemaking. Well said. Uh, final, if people want to get involved in your fight, uh, how do they do so? Website, uh, phone number, et cetera, to make sure that we have a voice like yours fighting for the little guy uh, so, out there. So if you want to find out more about the work that we do uh, at uh, the Alliance for Community Media, go to our website, allcommunitymedia.org, allcommunitymedia.org, to get more information uh, about uh, what we do in Washington, D.C., and in communities across the country. We have over 400 organizations that are our members in some 42 states. Uh, I like to say we go from Maine to Maui. Which <laughs> is actually true, although my, my, my member in Kauai says to me, I, I need to say we go from Kauai to Kennebunkport. There you go. It's true as well. Uh, a little less mellifluous, but it's uh, still good on the alliteration. Um, we're, we represent organizations all across the United States, big and small. And uh, I think that's the, the most important thing, is that uh, a voice in Manhattan, uh, New York, is as important as a voice in Manhattan, Kansas. Uh, and we need to represent that in our media system. That's the type of thing that we're fighting for. Mike Wasserman, the president and CEO of Alliance for uh, Community Media, has been our guest. Uh, Mike, thank you so much. All the best. Keep on fighting, and uh, we look forward to hearing back uh, from you and some, uh, some good results. Thanks again for joining us today. Thanks for the opportunity, Jeff. Thank you. We'll be right back. You're watching Free Speech TV. This is The Jeff Santos Show. They call me Prince like I'm royalty or something, but the places I've lived ain't no palaces. So I don't need grilled salmon or a new scratching post. Just give me a cardboard box and a can of tuna and we're good. You can even change my name. I'm cool being the kitty formerly known as Prince. Well, we've come to the end of the road of the Jeff Santos Show for this show. We uh, thank you for watching. We thank our great guests, and we hope that they gave you an understanding of the importance of our democracy, of our society right now in 2018 under Donald Trump. We thank Larry Korb on his understanding of the military and the concerns we have with Mr. Trump as the, uh, as the commander in chief. And of course, um, uh, John Bonaparte with what his members are fighting in a lockout that's now 22 weeks long and the importance of the right to organize and the right of, uh, of labor in this country. And finally, with um, Mike Wassimer, uh, the uh, issue of community media and how we have to continually look at what the FCC is doing in this country and how we can protect small towns, small cities, 
and of course big cities as well that give the voice to you, the American people. We thank them all. We thank Erica Jones and Adam Stone for producing this broadcast. And I thank you for viewing. We'll see you next week. My name is Jeff Santos, and I gotta go.